Hello and welcome to Nanobyte. This is part 4 of the operating system development series. Today we are leaving assembly behind and we get everything set up to start working in C. Up until this point we have used assembly to code our operating system. However, as you've probably already seen, Writing an assembly takes a lot of time and patience, and ideally we would prefer to use some higher level language. We can finally do that, since we are no longer constrained by the 512 byte limit of the boot sector, like we were in the previous videos. So let's step back for a moment and see where we are. So we have finished writing the bootloader that resides in the boot sector, which loads our kernel into memory and executes it. Unfortunately, there are a couple of things that we haven't done yet in our bootloader. As we talked about previously, the bootloader has three major roles. To collect information about the system, to get the system into the state expected by the kernel, and to load and execute the kernel. Out of all of these things, we've only done the last one, to load something and execute it. We haven't collected any information and we are still in 16-bit real mode. Obviously, we want our kernel to be able to take advantage of all the system's resources. This is impossible in our current configuration, so we will need to switch to 64-bit protected mode. This is something that the bootloader has to take care of. So let's create a second stage for our bootloader that will do all of these things. Continuing from where we left off in the last video, let's reorganize our operating system a little bit. Our bootloader will now be split into two stages. The code we wrote in the previous videos will be in stage 1, and the rest will be in stage 2. Instead of loading kernel.bin, we will load stage2.bin. Also, since our operating system is starting to become more complex, let's split our makefile as well. For stage 1, the makefile is pretty straightforward. You can use question mark equals to set default values for variables, in case they don't come from above. In the main make file, all we need to do now is simply call make in the subdirectory of each module and pass the build directory variable. We will also write make files for stage 2 and the kernel. For the moment, I just copied the kernel main.asm into stage 2, but we will change that in a bit. We will also need to modify the steps for the disk image assembly to change the file names and add stage 2. And finally, we should also take care of the clean target. Now we are at the crossroads. So what we want to do is to start using a higher level language. So what are exactly our options? What we need is a language that won't get in our way when we need to deal with low level stuff like manipulating memory, manipulating bits, talking to hardware, interacting with assembly code. We also need something that doesn't rely on a lot of runtime stuff, because we cannot import any libraries, we are on our own and we have to do everything ourselves. The most obvious choice for a language would be C. It is a language that most people are familiar with, 
It is the language that is used by most operating systems. It can work perfectly well without any runtime support and it is absolutely perfect for our purpose. C++ is another good choice, however the plus plus stuff makes it a bit more complex and some features do require runtime support like exceptions, like virtual classes and so on. Another option is Rust. It is a very new language that is also designed with operating systems in mind and it addresses many of the problems that exist in other languages like C. There are some experimental operating systems written in Rust and there are open discussions about starting to integrate it into some of Linux modules. However, there aren't any major operating systems using it right now. These are not all the options. There are many other languages available like Lisp, Forth, Smalltalk, Ada. However, for our purpose, we will use C. Now let's talk a bit about compilers. The most obvious choice would be to use GCC or C Lang. However, we have to remember that we are still in 16-bit real mode. And unfortunately, these compilers don't support this mode. For our second stage bootloader, what we need is a compiler that can support the 16-bit real mode. There are two ways in which we can approach this. We can try to find an old compiler from the 90s, like Borland C or Microsoft C or Watcom, but integrating it into our build system will be very challenging. These compilers will most likely work only in MS-DOS, so we would need to run them inside DOSBox or some other emulator. This, this is not a very good approach. The second approach would be to find some cross-compiler that can run on modern operating systems like Linux. And fortunately, there are a couple of options that we have. There is the Digital Mars C in C++ compiler. I'm not very familiar with it since I haven't used it, but I can say that it is a very old compiler that is still being maintained and it has recently been open sourced. It had many names across the years, like the Data Light C compiler, Zorland, Zortec, Symantec, and now it's called Digital Mars. The second option we have is Open Watcom. Now, Watcom was one of the best compilers from the late 80s and early 90s, but after its decline in the late 90s, it was released as open source in the early 2000s. Since then, a clone of the original compiler is being maintained and it fully supports all the major operating systems. Open Watcom is also used by VirtualBox to compile the BIOS, so it is still used in some major projects. The next few compilers that I will talk about are smaller compilers. These don't do very much optimization, their purpose is to be really small and fast. So they can be used to either fill in the gaps left by the big compilers like 16-bit real mode that we talked about, or to be used on embedded systems where there isn't much processing power. Among these are BCC or Bruce's C compiler, smaller C, tiny C, and there are many others. Out of all of these options, I have chosen to use Open Watcom. It works perfectly on Linux, it can perform a lot of optimizations, and my experience with it so far has been very positive. To install it, first download the correct version, after which you have to enable the executable flag by using chmod. After that you can run it. In the component selection menu make sure that you have 16-bit compilers enabled. The target operating system doesn't really matter because our bootloader is freestanding anyway, so we won't be using any of the operating system libraries. The compiler is installed by default to the USR bin Watcom directory and the C compiler command is WCC. The next step would be to integrate the compiler into our build. Going into the stage 2 make file, I created some variables for the 16-bit compiler C616 and the linker LD16. We will also use the Watcom linker, wlink, because it has built-in support for the obj object file format that is used by the Watcom compiler. This is also why we cannot use ld, which is the default linker used by GCC. It doesn't support the obj format. 
I use the wildcard function of make to get all the C and assembly files in the current directory. And then I use the path substitution function to change the names and paths to the target object files. Using the wildcard rule syntax, I created a rule to assemble all the ASM file to object files and another rule to build the C files. The always rule simply makes sure that the output directories exist. Putting it all together, we can now use the variables we created above to link everything into a single stage2.bin file. The command line syntax of the wlink command is a bit different than the one used by LD or GCC. Name is used to specify the output file and file is for the input object files which have to be placed between brackets. I have also added the map option which tells the linker to generate a map file. We'll get to this a bit later. Finally, we tell wlink that we have a linker script that contains additional options using at linker.lnk. We will create this file in just a few moments. How did I know all of this? From the documentation, of course. Open Whatcom is distributed with extensive documentation that can be found in the installation directory. For me, it has been a very useful resource to learn how to use the compiler, which compiler options to use, and how to do certain things like dealing with this weird segmented real mode memory model. Using this documentation, let's figure out what compilation flags we need. The dash 4 flag wasn't absolutely necessary. It tells the compiler to generate code compatible with the 486 CPU. Unless you want to specifically support these older CPUs, you should be fine using anything above the 486. Dash D3 tells the compiler to generate a lot of symbols. Note that these are only added to the object files. They will be stripped during linking, but they can be very useful when debugging, as we will see later. Dash S disables the stack overflow checks. This is a runtime feature that we cannot use in a freestanding environment unless we implement these checks ourselves. We don't really know how to do that right now, so we will keep them disabled. WX enables all the warnings. MS tells the compiler to use a small memory model, and I'll explain this in just a moment. Dash ZL tells the compiler to not add references to the standard libraries. This is very important in a freestanding environment where we don't have access to the standard libraries. Dash ZQ tells the compiler to be quiet and only display the warnings and errors. Now let me quickly explain what the deal with these memory models is. Back in the 80s, when the Intel x86 platform was created, computers were very slow and memory was extremely expensive. Software developers had to heavily optimize their programs to run on these extremely limited machines. One of the areas where such optimizations could be made was in how programs were dealing with memory. As we discussed previously in 16-bit real mode, the memory is addressed using the segment and offset scheme, and the valid address specification would look like this. To access some memory, you first have to load the segment into a segment register, and then you perform your memory operation. If you can group these memory access operations together so that you can load the segment less frequently, this will give you a small performance boost. If you could fit the entire code of your program or the data that you're using inside a single segment so that you have to set it only once, that would make your program a bit faster and also smaller since now you can use a smaller pointer size that only contains the offset. This is exactly what these memory models are trying to achieve. A small program that doesn't have a lot of logic and doesn't need to use a lot of memory could take advantage of the tiny memory model, in which, by default, all pointers are near pointers. This doesn't mean that programs cannot use far pointers at all. They can absolutely do that. But by using a smaller data type by default, 
the performance penalty and memory usage could be reduced. The operating system would take care of allocating a memory segment and it would set the code and data and stack segment registers to the same value. The small memory model is very similar to the tiny model, except that now we are using two segments, one for the code and one for the data and stack. All the pointers are still near by default, but this model allows programs to use a little bit more memory without any penalties. A program that has a lot of logic but doesn't need to use a lot of memory might work better using the medium memory model. In this model, far pointers are used for anything related to code, but near pointers for anything related to data. This means that the program can now have a lot more complex logic, but it is limited to a single segment for data and stack. The compact memory model is best suited for programs that have little logic but need to deal with a lot of data. In this model, near pointers are used for code and far pointers for data. The large memory model is used for programs that are very big and need to use a lot of data and a lot of code. In this case, all the pointers used are far pointers. Of course, this comes at the cost in terms of performance and memory. The huge memory model is similar to the large memory model except that it uses huge pointers for data. What this means is that all the addresses are normalized, so it behaves more like a flat memory model, instead of the overlapping segments that are by default. This comes at a huge performance penalty, as the compiler has to generate code that normalizes the pointers for each operation that involves pointers. But the advantage is that it makes things a lot easier for programmers, as well as it allows having a single array bigger than 64 kilobytes. The reason why I chose the small memory model for our project is that it is the easiest to work with and our bootloader will not be that big. If we wanted to use the medium, compact or large memory models, we would have to use an executable file format instead of a plain binary and we will have to write some logic that allocates the memory segments. We will just keep things simple and use a small model. Now we will write this linker script. The syntax of the script is very similar to the command line options that we have already used in the make file. The idea here is that we want to control how things are laid out in the output file. A standard executable file format typically has header describing things like the sections present in the file, the exported symbols like where the main function is and other things. This is something that operating systems look at when an executable is launched, but we don't want to deal with that. What we want is to simply jump into the first byte of stage 2 without having to parse any headers, search for symbols or stuff like that. Through this linker script, we can tell the linker exactly how to arrange all that stuff it puts into the executable file. First we will specify that we want to use a raw binary format. This way the output file will contain no headers or extra information that we don't need. Next we will add a few options. Quiet keeps the linker quiet about anything other than warnings and errors. No default libs disables linking the standard libraries, which as we talked about earlier, is something we don't really have access to in a freestanding environment. The start equals entry option tells the linker that the entry point into the binary will be the entry label. The verbose option tells the linker to add some extra information in the map file that we will look at a bit later. The offset equals zero option is similar to the org directive that we have used in assembly and it tells the linker where our binary is expected to be loaded in memory. This is a disadvantage of using raw binary files. You have to know exactly the address where your program will be loaded at so that the linker knows what addresses to use when replacing symbols like function calls, jumps, variables. Standard executable formats used by the operating systems are relocatable, meaning that they can be loaded at any memory address. The stack option tells the linker how big our stack will be. This would have been used if we enabled the stack overflow protection, but we have disabled it earlier. There are also some checks done during link time, which is why we have to set it. 
Next, we will specify the order in which the linker will place all the stuff into the binary. The way this works is that the compiler places all the things it finds into buckets, called sections or segments. For example, all the code will be placed in a code or a text section. All the constants will be placed into one or more const sections. All the global variables will be put in a data section. Each section has a name and a class. So in our binary we want to start with the code class, specifically with the entry segment, which will contain our entry point. After that we will place the text segment that contains the rest of the code. Finally we will add a data class, which will contain all the data sections. We don't really care about their order, so I haven't explicitly added any segments here. This is basically everything we have to do in the linker script. Next, let's create the entry point that we talked about. Because we have to do some low-level things, like setting up the stack, it would be best to write this part in assembly. So let's delete everything in the main.asm file and do this. I started with the bits16 directive to tell the assembler that we are writing 16-bit code. And then I used the section directive to tell NASM to place the stuff we will write next in the entry section. I declared an external symbol, underscore C start underscore, which will be the entry point from C. Next we want to export the entry symbol so it is visible outside this assembly file. This can be done using the global directive. After that I define the entry symbol. In the next few instructions I set up a basic stack. Remember that we are using the small memory model, so the stack and data segments should be the same. The data segment should already be set up by the stage 1, so I simply copied it to the stack segment register. Also, I reset the base and stack pointers to 0. Since they grow downward, they will wrap around at the end of the segment. So nothing should be overwritten as long as our stage 2 is kept below somewhere around 60 kilobytes. Another thing to note here is that interrupts should be disabled while setting up the stack which I've done using the clear interrupt flag and set interrupt flag instructions. Next I pushed the boot drive stored in DL to the stack and called the cstart function. By pushing it to the stack it will be passed as a parameter. If we ever return from the cstart function, for safety we will simply hold the system. Now we are ready to write our first piece of C code, so let's create a main.c file and declare the cstart function. The function will not return anything, it will get a 16-bit value indicating the boot drive and it will use the cdecl calling convention. We will talk about calling conventions a bit later. If you try to compile this code, you will get an error that uint16t is undeclared. So let's create an stdint.h file and define all of these types. Let's compile now and see what happens. And it looks like I messed something up. The first problem was that make doesn't like variable names that are not wrapped in parentheses. And I also forgot to include stdint.h in the main.c file. Also in the linker script I forgot some commas. I'm not 100% sure why I'm getting this stack segment not found warning. I suspect that wlink expects me to explicitly declare where the stack segment will be placed. I will do some more research about it and maybe find a way to get rid of it. But the code works regardless of that warning. Next to the stage2.bin file, now we can see a stage2.map file. Let's take a look and see what we got. As you can see, the linker gave us a lot of information about what it did. We can see where each symbol was placed in the binary file, as well as all the information we need about segments, their sizes and placements. This will be extremely handy during debugging as well. For example, if you want to set a breakpoint at a specific function in box, what you can do is look up the offset of that function and then you know where to set that breakpoint. Something very important to note is that the entry point address should be zero. If it's not zero, then there is a problem somewhere. What this means is that if it is zero, 
we can safely jump from stage 1 directly to the first byte of stage 2 and it will execute correctly. At this point I wanted to do a little housekeeping, so I renamed all the symbols from stage 1 that were still called kernel to stage 2. I also wanted to make Visual Studio Code happy and not give me any errors for the C decal declaration. So I created a new C++ configuration and set everything up, but what solved the issue for me was to add C decal in the defines field. Now that we can write code in C, how can we print some text to the screen? Easy, just call printf, right? Unfortunately, no. It's not that easy. Because we don't have any standard libraries, so we have to write printf ourselves. So let's start with something a bit simpler. Let's write a function that will print a simple string, unformatted string. And to achieve that, we first need to be able to print characters to the screen. So let's do that. If you remember from the first video, we already did something similar in assembly. And what the way we achieved that was to call BIOS interrupt 10 hexadecimal. Unfortunately, we cannot call interrupts from C. So let's just create an assembly file. x86.asm. Just like we did for the main.asm file, we need to specify that we are in 16 bits. And we need to set the section where the assembler will place our code. This time it's in the text section. Then we will create a function x86 video write chart teletype and export it using the global directive. This function will be called from C, so we need to follow the rules set by the calling convention we are using, C decal. I think this would be a good time to talk a bit about calling conventions. If you remember from the previous video when we read from the disk, we used a couple of registers to pass parameters to the read function. When working in a higher level language like C, in order to ensure intercompatibility between software, we have to establish some rules that all compilers and programs follow about how function calls are made. This is exactly what a calling convention is. It is a set of rules about what the caller and the function being called have to adhere to, so that functions can be called in a safe and predictable manner. Of course, these differ between different computer architectures, where you might have different registers, and even on the x86 platform there are multiple ones. One of the most commonly used, at least in the 16 and 32-bit modes, is the C decal calling convention. And this one should be supported by pretty much all compilers. Now these are the rules set by the C decal convention. First, the parameters have to be passed using the stack and they have to be pushed from right to left. Integer values or memory addresses are returned through the AX or EAX register and floating point values are returned through the ST0 register. The caller is responsible for removing parameters from the stack after the call returns. Registers EAX, ECX and EDX are saved by the caller, and the rest are saved by the callee. This means that the function being called must restore these registers to their original values before returning. Another rule is that function names that use the C decal call convention will be prepended with the underscore. This is why we declared underscore C start underscore in assembly, but the first underscore is missing in the C function. The Wikipedia article for the x86 calling conventions has a nice example on how to use the C decal calling convention from assembly, except that the example is for 32 bits. Let's go through our own example so we can make this as clear as possible. What we have here is a simple function that returns the squared length of a vector. To understand how this works, we will do the job of the compiler and rewrite this function in assembly following the rules of the C decal calling convention. Let's first look how we call this method. The first thing that we need to think about is the registers that need to be saved by the caller, EAX, ECX and EDX. 
If these registers are in use, we need to save their values by moving their contents to other unused registers or by storing somewhere into memory. The next step is to pass the parameters to the method. This is done by pushing them to the stack from right to left. So first we push Y and then we push X. Let's imagine that this is what our stack looks like. Remember that the stack grows downwards and SP points to the top of the stack. Also we are using 16-bit data types. We first push Y, which will be written to F026, and the stack pointer will be decremented by 2 bytes, and then we push X, same thing happens. Now that everything is set, we can call the function. Let's ignore for a moment what happens inside the function. And of course, according to cdecl, we have to prepend this with an underscore. After it returns, we need to restore the stack to its original state. How can we do that? We can either up x and y, just like we push them, or we can simply add 4 to sp. The next time we push something to the stack, these two will be overwritten. Let's look next at this method call. The first thing that happens is that the return address is pushed to the stack. If this is a near call, only the offset is pushed. Otherwise, both the segment and the offset are pushed. This is a place where these memory models come into play. In the small memory model we are using, unless we explicitly request it, all the calls will be near calls. In the medium and large models, these will be far calls. Inside this method, we will use the stack for all sorts of things, like local variables, storing arguments for calling other methods, temporarily saving registers. But before we can return from this function, we must restore it to its original state. Otherwise, return addresses will get messed up and our entire system could crash. The way this is done is by using the base pointer or BP register, which should point to the position where the stack was when we entered this function. Together, BP and SP will give us the beginning and end of the region in the stack used by the currently executing function. Since we don't want to lose the old value of the base pointer, we have to first push it to the stack. Then we can simply set it to the same value as SP. These operations are so common that Intel created a special instruction that achieves the same thing, called ENTER. Now that everything is set up correctly, we can write the contents of the function. First, we allocated the local variable R. To achieve that, we can subtract 2 from SP. This will leave a 2-byte blank area in the stack, which is where we will store R. Note that this won't really be blank, it will contain whatever value was on the stack previously. In order to perform the calculation, we need to get the X parameter. How can we get that? We know that BP will not change during the execution of the function, so we use BP to calculate the position of the argument. Looking at the stack, we can see that BP is pointing to the old BP, and then we have the return address, and then we have the arguments. We know that BP is 2 bytes long and the return address is a near address that is also 2 bytes long. So X would be at BP plus 4 and Y is at BP plus 6. After reading X into the AX register, we can simply multiply it by itself to get X squared. We want to save this temporary result to the local variable R. We can do this by going into the other direction. We can subtract from BP. The R variable is 2 bytes long, so R is at BP minus 2. We do the same thing for Y, and finally we add its contents to the R variable. Next we want to return the result R, so we need to go back to the calling convention and see how to do that. In cdecl, we return integer numbers using AX, so all we need to do is move from R to AX. The last thing to do before we can return is to restore the stack to its original state. We can simply discard everything that's on the stack by moving BP to SP. And then we can restore the old BP by popping it from the stack. Just like before, there's a special instruction that can be used instead of these two called leave. Finally, we can return. If this function was called using a far call, we would need to use the retf instruction instead.
The return instruction will remove the return address from the stack and we will end up with this add instruction which removes the arguments from the stack. Obviously, this isn't the most optimal code and a good compiler would find many optimizations. For example, we are adding AX to R and then copying it back into AX. This isn't very efficient, we could simply add R directly to AX. Also using a local variable is completely unnecessary. We could simply use another register, for example CX which is color saved anyway. While CDecl is not as relevant today since it's no longer used in 64-bit modes, other conventions will have a pretty similar set of rules. The biggest difference is usually in who performs the cleanup of the various things on the stack and how parameters are passed, because it is much faster to use registers instead of memory. Going back to our print character function, this is exactly what we must do. We first need to set up the stack frame, so we will save BP and then set it to the current position of the stack pointer. Before returning, we will restore these registers to their original values. And for the actual function, all we need to do is call int 10 hexadecimal and set up the proper arguments for the 0e function, which writes a character to the screen. So AH will contain the value 0e, AL will contain the character to print, which would be the first argument, and BH will contain the page, that would be the second argument. You cannot push a single byte to the stack, it has to be aligned to two bytes. This is why we are adding two and then four. BX is a coli saved register, so we must save it as well. And that's pretty much it. Now all that's left to do is create a C declaration for this function. And we must not forget to set the call convention to C decal, because Whatcom uses a different call convention by default. Now we can go ahead and create some standard I.O. functions. Put C and put S. For put C, we simply call the assembly function we just created with the page set to zero. For put S, we have a simple while loop that loops until str pointer points to a null or a zero character and in the loop we simply print the character and then increment the pointer. Let's see if this works. I will print the infamous hello world from C to make sure that everything works properly. Oops. Looks like we have a small bug. I messed something up in the write character assembly function. Instead of getting the current argument from BP plus 4, I was printing the return address, which is at BP plus 2. After fixing this, everything now works. I also wanted to show how to implement printf. However, since this video is already so long, I decided to move that to part 5 when we will also integrate the fat driver that we made. Something I'd like to mention is that what we did today wasn't absolutely necessary. In most tutorials that you will find online, this part of the bootloader is written in assembly, but I thought this would be a very interesting thing to try and it would also make things maybe easier to understand. We also got the chance to learn about some really important things that we will definitely encounter again in the future, like how the stack works, how function calls work, and how to mix C with assembly. Before we conclude, I would like to make an announcement. So I created this Discord channel, Nanobyte, with the goal of creating a community where people who are interested in creating operating systems can discuss, ask questions, and even make suggestions about future videos. If you are interested, you can find the link in the description below. That's it for today, thank you very much for watching and I hope this was very useful and interesting to you. See you in the next video, bye bye!